Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. You know, the Berkeley uh, way is 10 minutes after, but I think uh, people have actually been watching wall clock time. So, so I'm going to talk about how we architect parallel software with design patterns. And before I do, I want to make clear that my approach here, it, it's not like I'm a software engineering researcher and, you know, this has been my hobby horse and I keep kind of redoing my doctoral dissertation over and over in different fields. Um, the perspective I'm going to bring today is really from my 15 years of working in industry. Uh, most recently I was Chief Technical Officer of Synopsys when I left in 1998 to come here to Berkeley. And at Synopsys we had to get 25 products out the door on what seemed like a really fast uh, cycle of development, like every six month releases. Now with software as a service that's, that's, that's slow actually. It's routine to see three, three month release periods. And so what I, the, the kind of perspective I'm bringing today is really from my experience in software management more than any particular research perspective. So I'd like to start by talking about ways not to develop parallel code. So this is the, the approach where you take your legacy sequential code, you profile it, you find some hot spots, you take that performance profile, you recode that portion with threads, get in there, get your thread building blocks manual out and so forth get in there, profile again, keep going through this until you think it's fast enough. And how many of you have ever tried something like this? Just this approach, okay? How'd it work out? Ah, not too bad, okay? Well, what I've seen kind of around the industry is lots of failures. And oftentimes you'll see that at the end of all this work that N processors are actually running the code slower than one. So here we see, this is a real example done by one of my graduate students in a course where his final six thread version was, not a lot slower than a single threaded version, but it was slower. So if you don't like that, a lot of people say, well, you know, relax, don't, don't worry that you don't know how to do thread-based programming because we're going to do it all with our super compiler. So you just take your legacy code, pack it into our super compiler. Okay, maybe it's not fast enough, then you go through and, well, actually, you don't need to change your code. We'll actually tune our compiler to your example and we'll iterate through here until we can finally ship it. And I think the perspective, and, and I think many of those people who have been working in high performance computing uh, feel this even more strongly than I do, is that you know, there's nothing in 30 years of high performance computing research that gives us any indication that this is actually going to work. And so a typical, this is a, this is a real talk, I'm not picking on someone, and they're, they're presenting what I think are, you know, in many circles, perfectly reasonable speed ups, where they, they show, say, 8% speed up on spec benchmarks going to 15, and so the problem with this is that there's no way to scale up from 8 to 15 to 20% speed ups to really harnessing the power of 32 processors. So there are people who go, oh, well, okay, that's because you're taking too conventional approach. What you really want to do is you need to code in my new cool parallel programming language and go through and profile and so forth. And you don't have to convert all your legacy code, you know, just portions. And then if it's still not fast enough, I'll just recode more portions in my cool language and keep doing that until it's fast enough. And the thing that's a little hard to believe about this is we've already had over 200 parallel languages and growing, and there, there's not a single you know, pervasive success story yet. Okay? So I'm, I'm putting up front that I'm skeptical that any of these three approaches will work, although there's nothing that I'm going to say today that precludes using any one of those three approaches. It's just I'm saying where we should put the emphasis. Okay, so what's the alternative? So I think the alternative is, if I go back to the principles of software design that I learned in 15 years in industry, really for all the diversity, and I, and I got to work with a, a lot of really good programmers, all the way from Ken Thompson, you know, through Steve Chang, Rick Waddell, and so forth, a lot of really good programmers, and I really saw that, that what, they, what they did over and over that worked out well, really boiled down to two things. One is the use of modularity and the definition of invariance. So how does modularity help? Well, I'm going to start with kind of a, a industrial management perspective because this is really how I think about it. So modularity helps the, the architect, the person who's, who's kind of building the overall plan of the software because it makes the overall design sound and comprehensible. If you're a project manager and you've got a bunch of modules then if they're well designed, you can kind of deal those out to different people, and only are you able to assign them to different people, but then you can actually track their development and testing independently, and then, and then see how the whole um, 
project is coming together. If you're actually implementing a module, then, you know, so you, this is probably the first job you'll have in industry as a, as a programmer. You've got your module to implement. Then if, it's, if there's a good modular design, you can focus on your, your piece of design without worrying about a lot of other people, what a, a lot of other people are doing. Now, these modules also help you identify what I was talking about before, the key agreements, and as we'll see, the importance of key computations. Now, when I ran this by my students who haven't spent 15 years in industry, they go, well, that all sounds like good stuff, but, but what if you don't use modular? Okay, these are good things if you do. What, what if you don't? Well, I can tell you how that goes. Life without modularity, you get a lot of spaghetti code that's even in one individual piece of software. It's going all over the place. Um, you'll see if there's not proper modularity, then you'll see people kind of pounding on the specification document saying, no, 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 I implemented it correctly. You're the one who didn't understand what's going on. Um, You'll, you'll find, okay, I'm all ready to code, but because my software is not modular, I have to wait on somebody else to finish their portion before I can even start coding this next section. Or you pull out of the, you had a late night, you pull, you pull out of the parking lot at, say, 9, 10 o'clock. You can't resist looking at your email one more time before you go to bed. Look at that, my code broke. I mean, what could have happened on the way home, right? Well, it's because your module is not really, you know, segregated from someone else's. Someone else went in and their change of their code broke your code. It's hard to verify your, your code in isolation. And my, some of the super programmers in my research group tell me that the, the ability to verify their code in isolation is really what allows them to optimize. Because they know that they can kind of push the envelope on their optimizations, knowing that if they've got a good verification suite, they'll know if they broke anything. And then, Finally, as we'll see more and more, it's hard to parallelize without identifying the key computations. And if your code is all kind of mangled together with other code, it's hard, it's hard to tease out what those key computations are. Okay, so my point is modularity will help us to obviate all these. And this is not like a new software engineering insight or something. This has been in print since at least 1972. So modularity is important, but let me deliver a quick pop quiz here. So is software more like A, a building, or B, a factory? Okay, so how many people say it's more like a building? Raise your hand, please. I see two. How many people, three. How many people think it's more like a factory? All right, look like that. I'd go with, well, first let's see, the building advocates. Why is it more like a building? All the way back there. You, sir. Either one of you. Sorry, I was messing with that. Could you synopsize that real quick? Cookie. Uh, so I think generally uh, software can't be made into a cookie cutter sort of setup in the way a factory is. Mm -hmm. And each piece of software is custom designed to the situation that you're dealing with, you know, oh. like a building. Okay, thank you. How about one of our factory advocates? Who'd like to speak up for why it's more like a factory? Yes, sir. Down here in front. Could we get a microphone in front here? For a factory, you have stages where each stage can do one specific function to the final product. And the pipeline for, for these stages will end with your final product that you want to do. So each stage, just do one thing and do it good. That's mm -hmm. why I think about factory more than building. All right. Well, well, thanks for those insights. So software is certainly like a building. Be, you know, and I know because I've taught it as a building for, for over 10 years here in software engineering, we talk, we talk about architecture, right? We talk about the, the architect. And so it's certainly a building, and yet the more I think about it, buildings kind of just sit there, right? You know, they, 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 they provide shelter, they provide heat. Factories are more like software, I think. And notice that every factory is, is also a building, so nobody was wrong. But a, f a factory takes as input, it uses warehouse, warehoused prior results, and it produces output. 
And so it's, if there's one thing I'd like you to get out of this talk today, is to walk out of here, and if you've been thinking about software as a building, as, as I had for quite some time, to maybe start thinking it more like a factory. So um, and implicit in this notion is that of, of moving from a notion of building to factory is, is the observation that what computations we do are just as important as how we, how we do them. Okay? And I think the relevance of that will be clear in just a moment. Okay? So in architecting parallel software, it's about putting both the computation and the structure together. The structure is, is the building, and the computation is, is the, the machinery in the factory. And that we believe the key to productively building efficient and correct parallel software is software architecture. And a software architecture is simply a hierarchical composition of computational patterns, which we think of as the core atoms of computation, and structural patterns, which is how you, you, you the molecular bonds which hold them together. And this software architecture is what will give us this thing that I was so excited about, the modularity, which allows for efficient management, and efficient implementation, and efficient verification, and also enable us to, to identify the key computations and variants and interfaces. OK, so how do we do that? So first is identifying the software structure. Okay, so what we have here are uh, nine structural patterns. These are basic kind of, our, uh, Garland and Shaw called them architectural styles. So again, if we go back to thinking of the, of the building, software as a building, then these are kind of nine basic ways of organizing your building. And if we think of this factory plan analogy, then I would say this describes what is the actual layout of your factory. Then in addition to that, we identify our key computations. And so um, whereas the, the architectural styles that I showed you came from Garland and Shaw, and they have been around for at least 15 years, uh, this is more novel work. This is something that we did here uh, at Berkeley, starting with uh, the seven dwarves of computing, uh, framed by uh, Phil Colella, and adding six more. And so what we have here are what we consider kind of 13 fundamentally different types of computation. And what I show across the top here are a number of areas like embedded computing or spec benchmarks, games, machine learning, and so forth that we looked in some detail. And these are particular applications. Red here means that that particular computation shows up very intensively. So for example, graph algorithms show up quite a bit in embedded computation, computer design, and well as machine learning. Orange, somewhat less so. Uh, blue even more or less. And actually, I can see on this screen here, uh, there's a very subtle difference between green here, which is much less so, and, and orange, which is closer to red. So, but the, the general impression here is what we see is across these, these each of these different computational uh, classes appear in a variety of different applications. And each application, in some sense, if we look down the columns, is kind of unique in its mix of computations that it uses. But the key takeaway here is that there are 13 of these. They're not 300, and they're not three. So if there were three, this classification might be so small as to not be interesting, because it doesn't tell you that much. If there were 300, it would be so large as to be uninteresting, because what would you actually do with this information? So with 13 types of computations, kind of think of them as 13 different atoms, we believe we, believe we can build arbitrarily complex computations. And this is like the machinery of the factory. So uh, you know, again, if you walk out of here with one thing, it's we're moving from, from a building to a factory view. And so what we see here is when we, um, when we put the structure of the computation together with the mean machinery together, so these are, this is a particular example I'll be showing you in more detail later. This is the structure of a particular computation. We're labeled with the particular computations that you perform. Then you have something like an entire factory plant and this, this seems like a very good analogy, because if you go over to the uh, engineering library here, you find that there actually are books on building a factory plant. And they talk about a lot of things that we're interested in, too, like scheduling, latency, throughput, workflow, uh, resource management. There's even, there's even entire chapters on exactly how large should your work cell be. How large, you know, if it's larger, then it, if it gets too large, then it may be awkward to get the materials in there. If it's too small, then you may have too many to do the, the uh, work efficiently. So that's analogous to, to what, what problem? The, the, the size of, just the size of your work cell, what problem is that like in software engineering?
Is the question clear? So the work cell is, is you know, they're, they're kind of bigger and smaller. And, you know, smaller means you do just a few things. Bigger means you do more complicated bits of assembly. So if we think of that with analogy with respect to software, what, what, is, the, what is the corresponding problem? It's a problem I face every time I write a piece of code. Exactly. It's basically how, big, how what's about the right size of module. And of course, there's a lot of, a lot of opinions about that, and it's very much application dependent. But the point is, is that people have been thinking about these problems in other contexts. Okay, so that's the general strategy that we take for architecting Perl software. What I want to jump into now is actually go into some detail. So I'm going to start out with the structure, because that's actually what's, what's much more familiar to us, and talk about the use of structural patterns uh, in, in architecting software. So I'm going to show you three today, pipe and filter, iterator, and MapReduce. Now first, what is a structural pattern? So it really is very simple. It has kind of two broad pieces. Components are where the computation happens. This is where we put in our machinery, our computations. Connectors are where the communication happens. So you can kind of imagine that this is one, one kind of large area of the factory, and then when we, when we are about to, to pull all this together, we pull it together, and then we ship it off to another, another set of work cells where they do additional work. Okay. So these are the components and connectors. And then a configuration is simply a graph of components, that is vertices and connectors. So that's how we put these together. And the structural pattern, you know, which, which we'll be talking about, can really be described as family of graphs, families of particular configurations of these patterns. So again, here is our inventory, and here's the three that I'll be talking about today. But you know, keep in mind, you don't have to believe me yet, you don't have to agree with me, but take under consideration my assertion that with these nine patterns, we can build arbitrarily complex software. That if we basically, if we understand these kind of nine different ways of architecting things, we can build as big a building or as big a factory as we want. Okay, so the first one, perhaps the simplest one, is pipe and filter. So the filters are where the computation happens. That computation only sees inputs and produces outputs, so there's no global or shared state. This is pretty much ideal from a modularity standpoint, because if I'm, say, implementing a filter here, all I need to know is what my inputs are, I don't need to know where they're coming from, and what I'm supposed to, to output. I, because I can't share a state with anybody else, no one else's state can affect my computation. Okay, so what are some examples of this style of computation? This, this style of structuring computation? Yes, sir? Stream programming is, is certainly like that. That's on a very fine grained. So, I mean, uh, uh, signal, processing. signal processing pipeline is our full of this kind of computation. Absolutely. Compiler. Compiler, exactly. Uh, one more. We're on a roll here. Come on, try to be great. You're all you're, you're among friends here. Graphics, graphics is a little more, you know, certainly there are graphical computations which look like this. Come on, one more. Somebody else. Come on. No way, son. One more. Going once, going, okay, all right, fine. If this was a class, I would wait out the class. Given, given that this is a one-day tutorial, I'll, I'll I'll uh, go on. Okay, so here's our compiler example. Uh, we'll be looking at this image retrieval system later. Okay, compiler takes program, goes through these series of stages, produces object code. We'll be talking about this one. Here's one dear to my heart, logic optimization. We take a circuit net list, we scan it, we build a data model, we optimize it, we output it. As a matter of fact, you know, um, unless it was kind of designated otherwise, you could raise a name at the high level almost any program at the top level looks like this, because this is the very coarse grain structure, right? Basically, we, we take the initial input, we put some internal representation, and we produce some output. At the highest level, it's almost certain to be pipe and filter. Okay, let's look at one more. This is not a tough one. So in the outer loop, essentially, we have some initialization condition. We check to see some whether, whether some ex exit condition is met. 
If it has been met, we go on about our business. Otherwise, we keep iterating. And then inside this module here, then we have a variety of functions, and their nature is we kind of pack them all together because we don't we don't really care necessarily the order in which we're in which they're executed. So there's some parallelism there. What we do know is that we have to kind of synchronize the results up at the end of an iteration to check and see if the exit condition is, is met. So how about examples of this, this pattern? I'm sorry? That sounds good to me. So solvers in general are going, you know, do you, you iterate until you think you've got a solution or you've kind of maxed out and you're, and you're oscillating? Other ideas? One more? All right, okay. So I have a solver example here, which is basically we're trying to create a surface of, say, a quadrat quadratic program. We use this in support vector machine training. We update the surface. We identify if there are any outliers. If there are no outliers, then we're done. If there are outliers, then we're going to iterate to update the surface a little more to be within our error condition. Okay, simple enough. All right, one more, one more structural pattern, uh, MapReduce. So MapReduce is used largely at what major corporation? Sorry? Google. So Google uses this extensively. They use it in a little bit different, uh, the, the term a little bit differently than we do. Um, the, the term as we use it, um, it is, goes all the way back to its initial use in, in Lisp, the MapReduce function, where basically you map, in the map stage, data is mapped onto independent computations, or you can alternately look at the computation is mapped onto the data. But the key thing is that these data sets are all independent. So whichever way you like to graphically represent it. And then a reduced stage where we pull these all together, aggregate the results. So an example of a MapReduce computation would be? I'm sorry? Um, not fine. Can somebody come? Can you explain a little more? Oh, oh, word recognition. Okay. All right. Other examples? Ray tracing. Um, I I wouldn't call ray tracing exactly. That. There are some other kind. Nbody is our favorite for computation for ray tracing, and it's not that. I mean, I can see how you would do that if you've got locality here among the objects and pull together, but um, because ray tracing the the objects are a little more spread continuously, it's harder to get this these distinct independent data sets. I think. I understand if you're doing some sort of KD tree or something like that, it should be easier. So. Others? Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo, so again, these are structural patterns, and so this is just saying how we structure the computation. So you could imagine doing something like Monte Carlo in this, in this way, but, but just in terms of the way we, we structure, um, mon, that, that's not the first way I would try to do Monte Carlo, but if, if you can see how to puzzle your way how to do it, that's fine. Okay, well, let me give you um, the example that I'm going to use. Again, is essentially on the outer loop, we had that iterator, right, for doing support vector machine classification. On the inner loop, to actually do, you know, compute the surface or to compute outliers, then we do a MapReduce computation, which, say, across a bunch of these um, feature vectors here, tells us how far off from the frontier we are. Okay? So that's just an example I'll use later. Okay, so those are our three, and uh, those are not comprehensive enough to do all, all software. I'm not claiming that, but those will be comprehensive enough to, to build three different examples I'll show you later. So now let me move on to computational patterns. Now with the structural patterns, I was pretty confident that if I right now gave you a pop quiz about pipe and filter, you know, you'd probably all score at least 70. Ditto for iterator, MapReduce, we might see a, a little bit of outliers. On the computational patterns, if you're not already familiar with these areas, and I expect some of you are more familiar than I am, but if you're not already some familiar, you, you know, you're not going to get a mini tutorial on linear algebra in the next few slides. 
But what I'm going to try and do is for hope that there's enough breadth of familiarity that you're at least familiar with one of these classes of computation, and you get a general sense of what we mean when we talk about a computational pattern. So first talking about, uh, oh, sorry. So first talking about our whole class of computations. So again, there are 13 of these, which developed over kind of analyzing a broad range of applications over two or three years here at Berkeley. And uh, you know, after about two and a half years, this list pretty finalized, and we have been challenged by literally, uh, probably on the order of 100 different people, well, what about this, what about that, and so forth on these computations. And we haven't added any more yet. Maybe, maybe today could be the day. Of these 13, today I'm just going to talk about three or four. I'm going to lump uh, both dense matrix and sparse matrix together today. Okay, so linear algebra, I mean, I really kind of intend to leave it just this into it. Linear algebra is that stuff where you deal with vector spaces, you have maps, you, have, uh, you operate on matrices, you have sets of linear equations, you might compute eigenvectors or eigenvalues. And what's really great about this is we can broadly classify these into uh, three, <clears throat> three different classes called the basic linear algebra subroutines. And these kind of uh, boil down to whether we're, we're operating on vectors and vectors, vectors and matrices, or matrices and matrices. That's kind of three broad classes of looking at linear algebra. And the good news here is, if you're not too much of a linear algebra enthusiast and weren't really excited about the prospect of doing a lot of deep parallelization of your, of your linear algebra routines, then there's a lot of work that's been done to already help you with that, LA pack, scale pack, and so forth, culminating in, of course, the person who organized the boot camp, Jim Dummel's Applied Numerical Linear Algebra. So there's lots of software and lots of, lots of uh, text out there to help you do this class of computations. So that's linear, linear algebra. Another class of computations I want to introduce is the notion of spectral methods. Um, and it's interesting for me when I, when I stand up and try and explain these after you know, looking at some of these things for, for almost 30 years is really for me, uh, spectral methods are, are basically just talking about base changes, different ways of representing data, time domain or frequency domain. So in the example I'll be showing you later, we're going to take these scanned images and turn them in another domain to simplify analysis. And so um, what the reason that we stand up and talk about these methods, the, the, or the particular methods that we talk about, are some methods are much more computationally efficient than others. So um, we're going, we're, our general strategy is here, we're trying to find representations of data that are convenient and move from one convenient representation to another. And in general, this is an order in squared um, matrix vector multiplication. However, particular uh, representations, such as in the fast Fourier transforms, lead to faster, like order n log n transforms, and moreover, recursive transforms, which are more amenable to parallelization. Now, we don't have quite as much support for spectral methods and fast Fourier transforms as in, uh, say, linear algebra and so forth, but there are a couple uh, pieces of software here which will dramatically help uh, or facilitate your parallelization of these computational classes. And then the last one is kind of dear to my heart. This is uh, where I've done a, a lot of my work, which is on the class of dynamic programming. And these are classes of programs which have a very specific characteristic. That is that the optimal solution for the whole problem can be built up from optimal solutions to subproblems, or expressed in the uh, principle of optimality here. that the, say, for example, if uh, the representation of our data is, data is in a tree, that the optimal cover for the entire tree with a set of patterns consists of the best match at the root of the tree, plus the optimal cover for the subtree starting at in, each input of the match. So our basic strategy here is we're going to work bottom up in this tree, producing optimal matches or optimal results for each one. And then when we get to the root here, the best cover, say this is one potential match here at the root, this is another. The best match here will be built up from this match plus the best matches for B and Z. The best match here will consist of this match plus the best matches for X, Y, and Z. 
So let me give you a few examples of that. This is the one that, the, that's kind of one of my contributions to computer design of integrated circuits. So this is the circuit that we're starting with, which is kind of mapped down to the most primitive level NAND gates. And then here's a library that we want to use to cover this to do a more efficient implementation of this integrated circuit. And basically, the farther we go to the right, in some sense, the more efficient that is as a covering of this integrated circuit. So what I show you here is there's quite, quite a rich um, set of potential matches in which we can cover this tree. But to show you just one step of that operation, so this is, this is one set of covers here. Each of these labels a particular gate from a technology library for, for matching it. And this is the cost. So this cost of this cover here is 13. Alternately, at the root of this tree here, we can choose a, a larger and or invert gate. That, together with the optimal match for this gate, gives me a cover of, of 7. So again, just to give you uh, some intuition, so we're employing the principle of optimality here that at the root here, how we cover this node, we, we only need, we don't need to reconsider any work that we've already done before. We will build up the optimal cover of this node based on the optimal cover of the nodes that we have already visited. And we can also use this for code generation in compilers, so we can find the optimal code sequence for uh, expression tree here also by dynamic programming. And we can also use this, as I'll be showing you uh, in a bit, we can also use dynamic programming to do speech recognition. So what I show here are a class of, of observations. Recognize speech. And then what are a series of intermediate computations are uh, exploring what, is, what are the probability that the hypothesis is that this is actually recognize speech and what are the probabilities that it's actually recognize speech. Right? So that's computation can also be done with dynamic programming. Okay, so those were our um, three classes of computational patterns. Again, that's just three of the 13. Now what I want to do is take just these three structural patterns that I showed you and three computational patterns. Okay, they'll be a little fudgy, and I'll toss in a computational here or there but basically show you how I can do uh, in uh, large applications just with these. So let's start, first start about classification using support vector machines. Now support vector machines is a very powerful classification technique that's used in machine learning, and basically it's a two-mode classifier, so it's very good at, say, classifying if you have a bunch of pictures of kids, a bunch of pictures of, of flowers, it's good. It may not be so good at doing face recognition between these two kids, but it's pretty good at saying these are the flowers and these are the kids. And the way that is done is we have a bunch of training examples where we train the classifier, and then we get a set of new images that we haven't seen before. We extract features from those. We, again, train the classifier in those. We exercise it, and then we get the results. And there's also a loop here for, for user feedback in case we made some mistakes. So what I want to show you now is how we can take this, this kind of high-level example and we'll systematically go through and, and do a real architecture, this is not a toy architecture, this is a real architecture we use that allows to, to more easily parallelize this example. Okay, so this is the high level pipe and filter flow of this, of this particular application, and we'll start with the feature extraction. So the first step of the feature extraction is we build a scale space representation. So we're using like a SIF style, for those of you who are familiar with that uh, style of creating feature vectors, and that's using the structured grid routine. Um, and again, this is the one extra computational pattern which I, I, I uh, am going to slip past you. So this is, this, is, this is one more pattern that I didn't tell you about. And then we select out of these, these the space representation interesting port, points and support regions, and we'll do that using a set of MapReduce. And at the, at the individual computations in the MapReduce, remember this is just how we structure the computation. These are the computations we actually do. We're going to use some dense linear algebra. And then we put these computations together to build descriptors of the images, and we'll again do, use that using MapReduce over a structured grid. And here's a published paper about that. So that's just how we extract the features from these images. Then when we actually do the computation, well, we saw, well, we saw this one before. It's the classic example of the iterator pattern. And the outer loop in training, we um, go through a set of iterations. And what we're essentially doing is we have a bunch of feature vectors 
So that previous step gave us a bunch of vectors in N space, and we're trying to kind of create a frontier. We're just trying to classify this in two, so we're kind of talking about these are the flowers and these are the kids. So we're, we're training this frontier, and we do this iteratively, and basically we iterate until we have no um, feature vector points that are, that are incorrectly too far off the frontier. Okay? So they should all be in some acceptable distance, the frontier. Basically, they should be on the right side of the fence or close enough. So that's the fence that we're building here iteratively as we create this frontier. And that's in the train classifier. And in the ex exercise classifier, we get a new image. And then we take this image and create a bunch of dot products, which basically tell us information in terms of which side of the fence should it be. And then we actually compute the particular values, which tell us Exactly. Is it is this more like a flower, more like a baby? Okay. And this computing the dot products is just dense linear algebra, and computing the kernel values sum and scale is just map reduce over a single simple. We could call it a dense linear algebra. Basically, it's just a simple simple equation. Okay. So this is our whole support vector machine architecture. And again, you know, when I say software architecture. Kind of sounds abstract and high level, and is it too high level to, to really be useful? No. This is it. I've shown you the, the high level pipe and filter architecture, and then I've refined to the level that we did each of the individual elements. And then just to tell you the good news is, you know, kind of nothing up either sleeve, basically methodically going through here, we were able to do, build a support vector machine kind of mini framework or, or library, which was able to get um, 9 to 35x speed up. Uh, on the training portion of that, excuse me, 9 to 35 uh, speed up on the training, and up to 81 to 130 for classification, and this software has had a, 1,100 downloads since its release uh, just about going on two years ago. Okay? All right, any quick questions on that one? Are, you, are we beginning to get a little bit of feel of how this works? Kind of breaking big pieces of problems into little pieces of structure and computation. So first, look, okay. All right, so let me show you another example. So this is magnetic resonance imaging. So this is work we've done with our professor who is trying to address the following real problem. So MRI is difficult for anyone, but particularly for kids, they really have problem because you're supposed to be in there and you, you sit still, ideally even hold your breath. Uh, children hate that. They can't sit still. They, they don't like the long exams. Alternatively, the, the anesthesia is not only costly, but it's also risky on small children. So what we'd really like to do is accelerate the MRI acquisition. Okay? So these techniques exist. They've been developed uh, by a professor who just came here from, from Stanford um, to Berkeley. Uh, the problem is that the, that the uh, sampling the image can be done much more quickly, but reconstructing the image for the radiologist takes quite a lot of time. In particular, um, if it takes more than, say, five minutes, uh, then, then that's a, a non-starter for radiologists because they need to get that feedback to figure out whether do I need to do another run, do I need to, to do some more additional scans. So we took this problem, collaborating with, this is the professor, Mickey Lustig, uh, this is the actual MD-PhD in the radiology department at Stanford. And basically, it was boiled down to this simple uh, L1 minimization, this optimization problem here, which we then architected as follows. So again, this is, I don't know how complicated or uncomplicated this looks, but this is the real application that's running. So at the outer loop, we have pipe and filter, where the, 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 we pipe in the image. and goes through the set of Fourier transforms, linear algebra transformations, more Fourier transforms. And then in each of these, we have this an iterative finest step using the spectral method, which I told you about. So going through a set of convolutions, wavelet transforms, and more Fourier transforms. So this is the actual high-level architecture. And then this is the, what goes on in the individual boxes. And then using that, that approach, we were able to reduce the um, from the original reconstruction time of one hour down to one minute. So this was, you know, oftentimes with parallel computation, we're just making life a little bit better, what venture cops would call vitamin and not a painkiller. But this is a case where this, this uh, particular approach, though promising, 
uh, was clinically infeasible because the reconstruction times were too long, but we, we made them fast enough for clinical use. As a matter of fact, this is now in use at Lil, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, uh, where they're, it's being routinely used for pediatric MRI. Okay, so the last example I'll show you is speech recognition. Now, uh, speech recognition um, is, uh, well, let me just for say, in terms of computational classes, it's different. I just showed you two very numerically intensive examples. Now I'm going to show you something that's different. Okay, so in speech recognition, from end to end, basically goes, we take voice, just like me speaking now as input, we produce a word sequence as out output. Between that, we have a large signal processing module and where we capture speech features. So you've already gotten some sense of how this computation would go. It's a lot like the feature extraction that I, I showed you in the image case. So, and you, this is what we call naturally or embarrassingly parallel here. So we want to actually tackle the harder part of this problem, which is the inference network, which is given a bunch of speech features, okay, we've broken the speech down to little pieces, how do we infer what the proper word sequence is? Okay, and this is this general system architecture here is um, very uh, broadly used and also very modular, so it's not at all individual language dependent. So here's in one graph the high level architecture. So I'm not going to tell you how we built, blah, 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 we built this up. We're kind of conceding this to a preprocessor where we just take in speech features and then we're going to produce a word sequence. And this is the, the, the portion that was in the system architecture, the recognition network here. So if we look at the general class of computation this is, this is a graphical model, that's what we call it. But if we look at really at the guts of the computation, what really goes on, it's dynamic programming. And the dynamic programming is done through a series of iterations here. And in each iteration, we have a task graph structure in which we do, or uh, we could also look at this as a pipe and filter, in which we do a series of map reduces, and we uh, synchronize these all together and then do another iteration. So just to give you a little bit more detail on that, so this is, um, this is another instance of the dynamic programming that I showed you later. And, and the, the basic principle of optimality here is the best recognition of a series of speech rec observations. So these are kind of phony, I want to say phony, but it's actually phone, just raw sounds uh, after a time. The best recognition of this one is built up from the best recognition of, of, of the first n minus 1. So the, third, the best recognition of the third speech unit is built up from the best recognition of second and so forth. And we just keep moving this frontier forward. At each of those steps, say we're sitting here at S, considering to go in green, considering to go to S, basically we have the computation of what are the chances that we're really here? So kind of what's the score? How good is it, having seen the first two observations that we're really here? What are the chances are the probability of going from here to there based in, in general? We do that from our language model. So we take lots and lots of speech, and we say, what are the probabilities of these two sounds following each other? And then what are the chances that with this new observation, we've got one new phone, like in that recognized speech, so now we've got recognized, we've got that S coming. What are the chances of that observation that we're really here? We multiply those together, and then we update the maximum probability. Okay, then uh, looking at how we do the inner loop of that, you know, these three computations I just described you, we gather the operands, we do the probability of the op based on the observation, we do the maximum probability of actually being in that state. And then again, going back to this dynamic programming, so we do this state by state by state until we reach some, some maximum likelihood, okay, now we're really confident we know what that is, and we distinguish this, in fact, is based on our probabilities, recognize speech. Okay, and this was good news too. Now those numerical computations, um, you know, if we tell people that we sped up MRI by a factor of 60, you know, they're impressed, but they have a kind of, well, it seems that's very intensely numerical with these new parallel computing platforms. I kind of believe you can do it. Ditto for the image retrieval. But, you know, these hidden Markov models and these graph algorithms don't at all give the impression of the same ability to do massive numerical computation will help you, but in fact, here again, we were able to get 11 ups, speed up, or the sequential version. And more important than that, in some ways, is we went from three times slower than real time to three times faster than real time. 
And this technique is actually uh, being deployed in a hotline call center data analytics company. Okay, now uh, another example of this uh, same speech work um, was mixing together essentially lip reading information to augment the speech. Again, we were able to use a coupled hidden Markov model and that allowed us to get a 20x speed up in this application. So I'm going through these um, examples, not just to show you how we did it, but that there's kind of a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, that it's not just that we talk about how you can do this stuff, but in fact, we're, we're actually able to get these speed ups. So here are some other interesting results. Um, we have been able to uh, make contributions to speech recognition, to computer vision. This is both still, well, this is the video image processing, and this is still image processing. We've done some work on finance. I showed you the work on MRI, and I also showed you the work on machine learning. And the point of that is not, oh boy, you know, really smart. The point of that is that these boiling these computations down to these core computational patterns means that, that, that rather than encountering this really diverse fields where I never thought I'd be writing a paper on, on computational finance. I kind of thought that's just, I don't understand what that's about. But once we boil, down, boil it down to its core computations, then we can actually make a contribution there. So um, I don't know how many of you um, have heard Alan Kay's comment that with a proper point of view, you can add 100, 100 IQ points. I'm not sure the patterns add 100 IQ points to us, understanding these computational patterns. But I, do, I, I would honestly stand up here and say, I think that, that looking at things in those way, that way with this new perspective does add about 20 IQ points to us. And then also that allows us to have the computational insights, then the, the use of this pattern language and structure in the computation then allows us to write good parallel code, of course, to complement the insight with the actual implementation. Okay, so just to summarize, you know, we do believe the key to productive and efficient parallel programming is creating a good software architecture which is a hierarchical composition of structural patterns. I showed you three, and with six or seven more, that'll be all you ever need, as well as uh, computational patterns. This are the, uh, I, uh, I, uh, the key computations to be parallelized. I showed you three of these, and 10 more should be all you ever need in your life. And so the orchestration of these computational structural patterns creates architectures, which gratefully facilitates the actual development of the parallel programs. I showed you three examples of that. We ourselves have many more, many more in development. And if you want more information on the patterns portion, then you can go to this website where we have all the patterns that we've used in paralyzing these computations. If you want to know more about our research, um, this, is, this is our research website in the Parlab. And if you want to know more about this methodology, we're teaching a, a course, actually undergraduate course here at Berkeley on engineering parallel software. The course is pretty much uh, fully subscribed right now, but you know, if you're local or whatever, would like to sit in, now and then, uh, just let me know. Okay, so I have about five minutes for questions. Yeah, uh, and the gentleman with the microphone. So, Thanks. two questions. First, how these patterns are different from previous patterns attempt, like the Book of Gang 4? Mm -hmm. And second, how far you are going with these patterns? Are you trying just to show people that there is common patterns you can use or you are going to implement libraries or tools that people can use later on? They don't need to build everything from scratch. Great. Okay, those are both really good questions. So to the first question is, so the gang of four patterns um, in, the, in the book Design Patterns um, by Ralph Johnson et al., those patterns are for a particular layer of object-oriented programming. So the patterns we're describing are different in two ways. Number one, we're talking about how you go from conceptualization to implementation. So that's spanning the full process. And the other thing is we're focused on parallel programming. You know, the, the Gang of Four book is focused on sequential object-oriented programming. Okay. So um, it's always a little bit of debate. You know, I, can, I, I debate about showing the whole pattern language and so forth, but it's a little overwhelming in a one-hour lecture. Um, but you can, you can hit this um, link uh, right now, and you can go see the, the full pattern language. You'll get a sense. Now, to your second question, absolutely what we are trying to do is capture um, these patterns into 
software into entire frameworks. And so let me risk going kind of off ramp here. And I think I can show you. I'm going to show you real quick. Um, so here's an actual framework that we built using the patterns. So we've done a number of implementations of the speech applications. And this is basically how, how the, 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 that high-level computation, those three phases, are portioned over the CPU and over the GPU. And then what you see here are a number of different um, extension points that a programmer can go in and, and create their either select from pre-existing library elements or add their own library elements. So definitely where we want to go with this is kind of packaging it together uh, in, into libraries and frameworks to speed software development. Thanks. Question here? Yeah. I'm glad you have CPU and GPU there because my, my question was, what role does hardware play in, the, in, your, in your software architecture? I mean, surely running on a, on, a CP, on a CPU or on a GPU or on something like Franklin must play a role in, in the architecture you use. Absolutely. No, so that's, a, that's, a really, that's another really good question. Um, let me again go off track here a little bit. So what I showed you today was really this layer of the pattern language. So in some sense, I would claim what I showed you, I mean, I didn't really show you any parallelism today. I didn't say, oh, and here, now we do a thread for this, or we use mass. No, I just kind of showed you the general strategy of how we architect. Then we go, OK, how are we particularly going to parallelize this? Now, I claim, and it's a work in progress, I don't know, I have arguments with some of my co-authors, that at this level, it's pretty much the same whether you're going to a multi-core CPU, a cluster, or a GPU. Some say, well, it will in, you know, influence your decisions even up here. What I definitely believe is that your choice of the particular algorithmic strategy for parallelism, whether you want to use task parallelism and data parallelism, that will obviously be very much be influenced by your final target. And so that's done here on how the, the kind of execution patterns, whether you're using SIMD or task queues and so forth. And so uh, certainly, so briefly, the answer is certainly from here to here, your final hardware will influence perhaps all the way up here. But I actually think that at this level, it, it might even look the same whether you're going to sequential software, parallel, parallel software, or even hardware. That, that at my high level, my system description, say that I gave you a speech, might look the same even if I was going to an FPGA implementation. Time for maybe one more. Yes, over here. Back on the um, the speech recognition, and maybe you sort of answered this in in saying that you you really weren't hadn't yet addressed the or, or were telling us about the structural patterns, not about the parallel patterns. Um, but I didn't wasn't sure whether the parallel approach would be um, sort of to the the map reduce on each. Um, phoneme or whatever, and, and stepping along. But w what about the um, starting at multiple places, p picking um, oh, okay. pauses and, and starting you. multiple streams at the same time, good. and then doing a map reduce over those? Good good point. So what this gentleman is pointing out is that um, if so imagine speech is a very, very long string of, of sounds, right? And so there is a data parallelism in that we could just chop that string into pieces, and we could do those independently, and then we could kind of patch them together. And we, you know, every so often, you know, we would chop a word like recognize, and the reco would go with that batch, and recognize would go with that. So we'd have to do some patching together, which would take a little time. But if we have enough, large enough, then that would be useful. Yeah. So that certainly that kind of um, easy data parallelism is obvious and and very useful. You know, the call center that we're working with uses that, and not where the research challenges are. But, but thank you for pointing that out as well. Yeah. Okay, I guess I, I can keep answering questions until somebody else shows up to give the next, or is, is this it for the talks? Um, yeah, after this we'll be holding questions until that time for the talks. Okay, if there is, if there is any, any like burning question, one more? Otherwise you can, you can get, I'll, I'll hang around here for a minute or two afterwards. Okay, thank you. Oh. <laughs>
but wait. Uh, okay, well, how do you think about the new model uh, Pregel? The Google Google developed the, the new model, parallel model Pregel. Uh, I'm not familiar with it. Um, in general, as I pointed out with like the MapReduce, we haven't found very coarse grain patterns that are useful in the cloud that useful. So, so in, in case it hasn't been clear, I think everyone standing in front of you and these three days of boot camp is talking about the kind of parallelism that would show up you know, between your mobile handset all the way up to, say, a heavy, really heavy-duty Tesla-empowered desktop. You know? So we're not talking about cluster, and we're not talking about parallel computing. But I'll go take a look at Pregel. So you, yeah. Thanks.